from HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 109, recorded live Wednesday, April 16th, 2008. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web Applications. Online at www.telerik.com. Support is also provided by .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading .NET developer magazine. Online at www.sys-con.com. In this episode, Scott discusses dynamic data with Microsoft ASP Senior Program Manager, Scott Hunter. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'm sitting here at the MVP Summit in Redmond, Washington, with Scott Hunter, a senior program manager on the ASP.NET team. And uh, Scott is working on dynamic data right now. We just actually came from his dynamic data talk that he gave to all the ASP.NET MVPs, and I had recently done a, a post on dynamic data, and I was joking in the post that I thought a small percentage of people were going to care about ASP.NET MVC, but a huge percentage of people were going to care about dynamic data. Now, people are using that percentage, I said 5% and 95%, but those numbers I just, I just made up. But it seems like a lot of people are using the data grid and there was a, there was a gap. The data grid didn't do something it needed to do. And dynamic data just completely takes that concept, fills it up and extends it. Yeah, I think the big thing that we do in dynamic data is we take some of the controls today that are fairly limited. I mean, if you take a grid, a grid's a great example. Um, if you want to customize it, really it requires a lot of work in that, you know, by default you get this great, very quick page. But as soon as you decide you want to go and change the way something works or you want to add some validation, there's no validation in a grid. So um, I, th- I think that's our strongest point is, you know, if you want to go modify a, a field in a grid, how do you do that? you got to go templatize each field. you got to put all these validation controls in there. And one of the big things that we try to do with dynamic data is uh, look at your data model and learn from what what your data model says. It's going to tell us, you know, what fields are required. It's going to show us foreign keys and the tables they associate with. So we can do lookups and, and show the, the nice name, not the ID. We can show a drop-down list. Um, we can do things like look at the string lengths and make sure that the UI matches the string length. If you just do those three things uh, across a website today, it means you're going to take a grid, you're going to turn every column into a, a, a template column, you're going to drag a, a text box in, a required validator in, maybe a compare validator if you're looking for an integer or a date mm-hmm. or something. You want to make sure somebody types the right value in. Uh, and so I, I think one of the things we really do is we solve a lot of that for you. And, and we do it without doing it with magic. You know, a, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of fixes you could do for this would be, um, okay, we're just going to add all this for free. And uh, the problem with that is as soon as you want to change it, what do you do? Well, one of the things you're going to notice in a dynamic data project is there'll be a folder in your application called dynamic data. And if you drill into that, there's a, there's a directory called field templates. And that's where all the logic that I just talked about is going to exist. So if you go into that directory, uh, in the case of like, uh, editing an integer, there'll be an integer editor, in, integer under edit, ASCX file in there. And inside that file is going to be a, a text box where somebody's going to type the integer. Uh, there'll be a required field validator. There'll be a compare validator to make sure it's actually an integer. And there'll probably be a re- regular expression validator in there as well. So let's say you want to change that. Um, you know, you've got some third-party control vendors, uh, rich edit control that uh, um, automatically prevents you from typing anything other than digits and, and enforces no decimal points. For What you do is you go take the integer edit, you drag that stuff in there, you wire it together, um, and that change persists across your entire application versus today, you would have a, a grid or a details view, and you would go in and templatize every column and then go fix it across your entire app. So by right. centralizing this into one spot, I, I think we really help things. Because now you're doing that in a data grid. I've done you know, either a data grid or a repeat or anything like that. You're doing it on a, on a one instance by one instance basis. But you're p- pushing this all into one location, so it's centralized. The entire app can use it. But I can say, I want this column, which is an integer, to use the new custom integer stuff, but this other column right next to it, not to. That's correct, yeah. So uh, we have our, our built-in field templates that exist in this directory, and if you modify one of those, it's going to change your, your entire website. But at the same time, you can also add your own uh, custom one. So let's say it's Scott Hanselman's integer edit. Um, then what you can do is go to your data model, and by applying an attribute to your data model, 
uh, you're telling us which table in your database you want this to apply to. And you go, well, what if I don't want to change it for uh, every time I show that table? Well, we also let you specify that anytime uh, you're in an individual page. So, for example, on a, on a grid, you could go in there and say, I want to put a dynamic field in, and one of the parameters for dynamic field is a UI hint. And in that UI hint, you can actually override uh, the attribute that was on the model or not even have an attribute on the model and just specify it there. So is a UI hint, like if I had a string in the database, but I'm thinking that that's really a URL, would I say in the UI hint that this is a URL or is that a different attribute? We, we actually have a different attribute for that. We have one called data type. Uh, okay. one, of the, one of the big negatives of, to me of a, of a database today is if you look at it from the CLR world, once it comes into the database, we, we just go, it's either a date, it's a, a, a numeric field, or it's a string. And, you know, a string could be a social security number, government ID, it could be a uh, URL, email, an URL. email address, yeah, yeah. and you probably want to deal with all those in a different way. And so we actually have an attribute called data type, and you can put a data type attribute on your data model, and that's basically telling us uh, what that should be. And some of the ones that we have out of the box are things like email address, URL, uh, those are already in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can also add your own. So what we do is we actually have an enumeration uh, that has about 15 or 20 built-in values, but the, uh, the, data, the, the data type attribute also takes a string, okay. so you can do custom ones. Um, if, if you type in, like, uh, URL, we'll actually go to that field template directory and see if we find a control called URL. Okay. And if we do, we'll automatically display it. If not, we'll fall backwards down to text. All right. Well, let's let's is a good idea. Let's let's do this. Let's let's kind of do a pretend hello world application here. But I want to. Uh, I say file new, and I pick the the dynamic data um, project type. I can use the wizard if I want, and it'll build a lot of this for me. I can point it to a database and pull some information out, and it'll give me a. a you know, we've seen this on the websites, and people can look at the screencast that I'll put links up for, and we'll get an administration grid edit all the crud for free. Let's say that one of those fields is a string, but I want it to be an international phone number. So what do I need to do to say that this database that has a column that has a string is really an international phone number? Yeah, so what I would do in that case is is the first thing you're going to do is you're probably going to go to your uh, app code directory. You're going to right-click and say, I want to add a new class. Yep. We're here at the MVP Summit. We've got a bunch of people who've just apparently successfully compiled an application and <laughs> decided that that's worth cheering about. So uh, we're, we're filming here in the uh, in the conference center. Wrote their first Hello World. Sorry, you so, were saying. Uh, um, anyways, uh, so yeah, what you do is you go and you add a new class to your project. Um, uh, we support Link to SQL and Entity Framework. Both of these uh, generate partial classes for all the tables in your database. And so in this case, what table were we talking about? Well, let's just say that I've got a, a customer and he has a phone number, but let's say that they're international phone numbers. Okay, they're so unusual we've, we've got a customer table. So what we do is we'd go and, and override the customer table, uh, the customer object that's automatically created in the uh, data model. And so I would go add a new class, call it customer, because I, and I'd make it partial. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. So I've got a link to SQL model or a link to entities, and it's got an automatically generated partial customer. That's correct. I'm making the, the rest of it, the other part. That's right. And and the reason we're creating our own class is because you could, you could go right into the designer file created by the link to SQL editor, but the negative would be then if you recompile your application, you're going to wipe that change out. So right. that's that's the whole idea of partial and why it was added in ASP.NET 2.0. Exactly. So we're going to keep that little extra bit of metadata off to the side in another fo- in another file. In a part, that's part that's of correct. Class. So okay. so we're going to go over there and and create that class. And uh, uh, one of the negatives of the CLR today is there's not a great way to add uh, metadata to an existing member in a in a partial class. Okay. And the way we solve that is we actually create a a metadata class that maps uh, to your existing class. So what you're going to do is is after you created this customer class, you're going to create a customer metadata class. And then you're going to go put a, a, an attribute on your customer class that says, hey, my metadata is on this customer uh, metadata class. Which I assume could be anywhere in your assemblies. Anywhere in your assemblies or uh, in your own Okay, DLL. so I could put all this metadata in one place. Exactly. You could go take all this metadata, put it in its own library somewhere, and just go wire it up at the, uh, at the end. Okay. Um, and then what you would do is uh, take any members uh, from your class that you want to add metadata to, you'll just create a, a blank placeholder inside of the, the temporary class or metadata class. Okay. So, for example, in our case, it would be the... The international phone number. International phone number. So I'd, I'd create object international phone number, get mm-hmm. set, and then on top of that, I would actually add the data type attribute. Okay. And since international phone number is not one of the ones that's part of our built-in enumeration, okay. I would open a string up and say, 
international phone number. Okay, so at this point, I've taken my data model and I've added a little metadata class and I'm starting to annotate it with with hints that I'm going to need because we're trying to keep things dry. We're trying to not repeat ourselves. We're going to say in one place that this column is an international phone number. But we haven't really declared what an international phone number is. That's, we, okay. that's correct. We have we have two choices now. We have, uh, by default, this thing's going to be shown using our text control because technically in the database, it's a text field. Okay. So we have two choices. We can go modify the existing text template. And, and, and if I was going to do that, I would load up the text.ascx.cs file. Mm-hmm. Um, and inside of there, I can actually write a simple link, link query to say, I want to look at the attributes that are specified on uh, this field and see if there's a data type attribute. Ah, I found a data type attribute, okay. and it's international phone number. Well, because of that, I'm going to change my rendering now. Instead of emitting just the actual text value, how about I, I throw a hyperlink up oh, okay. and automatically put the right, right stuff in front of the hyperlink to try to have it dial a phone. So I think I see where you're going here. We've declared that there's this thing, this new data type called international phone number, and we're saying we can do one of two things. We can either piggyback it on the existing uh, you know, string underscore. It would be string or text. It would box. be text. It would be text under. It would be text. ASCX. CS. Okay, so we could extend the existing text box, the dynamic text box, uh, the ASCX, and say within there, if it's a text box, do the old fashioned thing. Versus if it's an international phone number, it needs this one additional piece of work. Correct. Maybe a, a, an extra label or a special validator, or show it as a URL or whatever. And if I'm guessing where you're going with this, or I could make an entirely separate ASCX. That's custom to international phone number. That's correct. The, my other choice would be if, if, if this type is so different, um, I might just say, hey, I need a new control. And so I would go create a control in the field template directory, directory called international phone number. Mm. At which point, not only do I, do I create the international phone number control, but I can also do an under edit version and an under insert version, which allows you to override how, it, how, how we display that when you edit and how you, we display that when you insert. Okay, so you've brought up something interesting and underscored it, the idea that there's this convention such that it's data type, underscore, and then the action? That's correct. So so data type by itself is the display. Okay. Underscore edit is for editing, and underscore insert is for inserting. Okay, so when the grid is in that state, or when the field is in that state, this is what we'll display. That is correct. Okay, because I might want to have a, like a rich text type and have a really rich text box, like freetextbox.com or, you know, if, if, like with like Telerik, one of our sponsors, use like a really complicated, rich editor. But I might want it to be an iframe when it's not being edited or display it in some other Exactly. Way. Oh, uh, we okay. pretty much give you the ability to customize as, as much as you want. Um, I, I actually want to jump off for a second and go down a different path. We've, okay. We've talked a lot about grids and, and detail views. Well, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff underneath this that we're completely crossing over. Well, I, I also want to talk about the fact that we do templated controls as well. So okay. one of the great controls that was brought out in, in uh, ASP.NET 3.5 was the list view control, mm-hmm. which for all the people that had, you know, a lot of folks have been using our controls. They wanted to use a repeater because mm-hmm. it really right. gave them lots of customization. But as soon as you start trying to do things like sorting and paging and stuff like that, well, you end up writing, you know, two or three hundred lines of glue code. That's a good point. And, and next thing you know is, is you know, the repeater's gotten unwieldy. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where list view really helps you because it gives you all the power of, of repeater mm-hmm. where basically all the markup is controlled by you, um, but you still get all the features like uh, sorting and paging and stuff mm-hmm. uh, part of the control. Um, we also support list view and form view, which are the two templated uh, controls that we support, which means you don't have to feel like you're limited to just a grid or a, a, That's a, good a point. table it generates. I think that people, when they initially saw a data grid, myself included, thought, oh, it's auto-generating a website and it's scaffolding. And that was one way of pigeonholing it. But it's bigger than that. And then I, I, I've, in, I've indirectly pigeonholed you into the data grid, but it's it's bigger than that. I was talking with uh, Peter Blum, Peter Blum, who makes the validators, and he was explaining to me that there's so much underlying support for for metadata that one could build something entirely new from just the underlying control, the underlying classes you guys have within dynamic data. But then let me get too far off, off, off the path. So within a list view, I have control over my own markup. I could make some kind of a, a list of, of stuff that is not at all a data grid. It doesn't look anything like a data that's grid. That's correct. Um, and that's, that's the point I want to make sure is I don't want people to, to pigeonhole this technology and go, oh, we're just grids, we're just details views. No. If you want to control all the markup, you can control all the markup. A form view allows you to place okay. the controls anywhere on the page you want. A list view is is you know something that repeats over data. So okay. so if I've got a list view and I'm doing the markup, maybe with um, you know, I want to do it all CSS friendly and I'm using unordered list and list item, 
controlling it myself. What do I put in my template to to get dynamic data features? Right. So what you're going to do is, uh, earlier when we were talking, we were talking about in, in grids and details view, we use what's called a dynamic field. And we do that because, you know, if the existing controls have a bound field or a mm-hmm. checkbox field, so we were trying to follow that pattern. Once you get to the templated controls, we have a dynamic control. Okay. And the dynamic control, basically you specify the uh, column that you, you're interested in, and you can also specify the mode. And obviously we have three modes. We mm-hmm. have a, a read-only mode, we have a edit mode, and an insert mode. Okay. And, and this makes a lot of sense in the case of if you're building a template for like a list view, mm-hmm. it's got different templates for each of those modes. Right, because, and because a new is, is different than an, an, an edit. That's correct. Hold that thought. I'm just going to take a, a quick second to thank our sponsors, and we'll be right back. Hi, it's Scott Hanselman here. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. I'm coming at you from another place in time. Sorry to interrupt the show, but I want to let you know that putting together a podcast like this every week isn't free. The folks that pay the bandwidth bill is Telerik. They make the show possible, and they also make some pretty cool products like Telerik Sitefinity. It's a development platform for constructing websites, community portals, and intranets, built all on ASP.NET 2.0, so you're using the various well-known goodies like master pages and membership services, data model provider, things that you already know. It's pretty flexible. You've got a very robust core that you can customize. You can plug in anything that you want from complex applications for a CRM or just a little widget that displays the weather. If you're not big into the code thing, that's cool too. You get a full set of features out of the box like workflow, multilingual sites, content versioning that can all be added without code. There's also a whole bunch of pluggable modules and components for news, blogs, forums, polls, lists. This is all stuff that you can do without code. And it's a pretty good-looking product as well. You've got a nice Web 2.0 administrative interface that lets you, as well as your boss who's not technical, be really productive. So check out sitefinity.com, and uh, we'll get you right back to the show. Thanks a lot. Because so we were talking about the list view, and you were heading in a direction. Yeah, I was. I was going to talk about dynamic control and and what it really does for you. And because that's the heart of the system, isn't it? Yes, actually, underlying everything in dynamic data is a dynamic control. Even though I was mentioning earlier, we have this dynamic field. Mm-hmm. If you look at the source code for dynamic field, all it really does is sticks a dynamic control in itself, mm. and it's looking at the grid or the details view to figure out which mode it's in. Okay. In the case of a list view or a form view, you know you control the mode. So. Uh, as I was going to say, is when you have a dynamic control, what you're going to specify is the column you want to work on mm-hmm. and the mode, be it read-only, insert, edit. And what that really, what we look at is we look at, um, okay, you say that the, the column is X. We're going to go look at your database and, and see what the model says for, for that column. Oh, it's an integer. Okay. So that's going to tell us to go look up the integer field template inside of our field template directory. Okay. And then based on the mode, we're going to pull the right, uh, the, the, the right version of integer. And so basically that's, specifying, you're basically telling us which uh, field template to use. Mm-hmm. So you still get all the, the benefits of being fully templated, control of your markup, uh, uh, whatnot, and you get the power of dynamic data still. So I think that's really the uh, an area that I, I want people to make sure they, they understand. And I've, I've got one more area that, that I, I think people always, when they f- see our first demos, uh, most, of, most of the first demos of dynamic data are this scaffold. I mean, basically you, yeah. you drag a model in, uh, you Register your data model, and, and with like one line of code, yeah. you've got this full application built up. And and the, the audience we're missing there is, what if I have existing web pages? Exactly. And that was the question: How do I add dynamic data to existing sites without messing stuff up? How do I put my toe in the pool and see if the water is nice without accepting it for all of my data access? Right. And and I think we 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 give you that benefit. So. I don't want to go through all the steps of, of actually what you would do. I mean, the, the, the overall steps are you drag this dynamic data directory in, mm-hmm. you make a few changes in web config. Right. Uh, what I really want to get down to is I've got this page in my application. What do I change in the page? Exactly. So what we have this new control, kind of like a script manager. We now have a dynamic data manager. And you put this control in your page. Mm-hmm. And then any controls that you want to have our functionality, you register with this control. So, for example, I'm going to add a dynamic data manager to my page, okay. and I've got a grid view, and I've got a list view, and I want both. And of them. they work already. They already work. Okay. And I want to turn on this magic field template stuff that okay. we've been talking right. about. But just for a couple of things. Just for a couple of things. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll go and and I'd, let's say I just want to turn dynamic data on for the list view. Okay. So in my uh, page under init in my code behind file, mm-hmm. I'll say dynamic data manager one dot register control, and I'll specify the name of the list view. Okay. And once you've done that, you basically flip the switch to turn on dynamic data access for the list view. So then I can start using a dynamic fields. Yes, dynamic control, dynamic in, control. inside of your your field inside of your templates in your, in your list view. Okay, that, that's all it takes. That's it. 
So there's a couple of other um, folders that when you underneath this dynamic data folder, I noticed that when I made a scaffolding, I had uh, a paging and and filtering, and all those things happen automatically. Yeah, we have a, we have a couple of directories. One of the one of the directories is called content. Uh, content is as we started building dynamic data, we we ran into this problem where we wanted a pager, we wanted some other controls and stuff. And so what we did is uh, we created a, a directory called content and gave you the source code to those controls as well because we said, you know, not only do we want to give you a, a pager, not only do we want to give you a, a control for doing a drop-down list of, of uh, filters, mm-hmm. but we want to make sure one, one of our goals in dynamic data is never to make you feel like we've, we've built something that you're going to fall off a cliff on where it's like, okay, I'm going to use it up to this point and I'm going to die. So, you know, that's the thing as someone who, I mean, I guess I've only worked for the company for six months, but I always, I gave a talk at dynamic data in, in New York and I was saying how, most Microsoft demos involve someone, you know, dragging something onto the, the page. You drag a data grid over, you hook some stuff up, and then you wave your hands and you push F5. And like, hey, look, I did a complete application. And then by the time the audience is saying, hey, but wait, I want to c- customize. Hey, you've left the stage at that point and it's over. And when I, when I uh, think about that kind of, that kind of a canonical old style example where, oh, it's totally customizable until it's completely not customizable. <laughs> And it's it's cool that there's more and more people. I mean, you haven't been in the company all that long either. I guess that, that more and more people are getting to the point that we had this pain as people on the outside. So now we're coming inside to make sure that that doesn't happen to anyone else. Uh, true. It's kind of funny because we actually had some raised eyebrows when we first started working on this because um, some of the feedback that I know the ASP.NET team had moving into ASP 2.0 mm. Was you know, let's make a blank project start with the, the least amount of files as possible. Yeah, exactly. And so here you create this dynamic data project, and we get this directory full of all these files. Right. And the reason we create this directory full of all these files is instead of hard coding all these things absolutely into your application, how about we just give you the source code to all the pieces you might want to touch and tweak? Exactly. Uh, so if you don't like the way our filters look, yeah, yeah go, exactly. go in the content directory, modify the filter. If you don't like the way the pager looks. It's just a user control. Exactly. Go in there and modify yeah. the, the behavior. If you don't like the field template, that's the whole point of the field templates was to actually give you the source code. You know, right now, a, a bound field or a checkbox field mm-hmm. or an image field, you have no control over those. As soon as you exceed their, their capabilities, you're done. You know, speaking of images, uh, you showed me a demo that I thought was pretty cool where you were using a, a database where one of the columns had uh, a binary format that had some funky picture in it. It was you know, not a. It was a non-standard thing. It was like a not a GIF, not a PNG. It was an old style thing. So just assume that you have a database with many columns, and one of the columns has something something funky in it. Could be a PDF. Could be a data format that's your own. And and you want to invent uh, a visualization for that. You you made one called DB Image, and I thought that the way that you had created that was pretty interesting. Yeah. So what, so what Dynamic Data does is is you know as as I mentioned at the, at the beginning of the of the talk, we were talking about, we look at the data model and try to figure out what uh, we should show for each of the fields. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obviously, if something's binary, Mm -hmm. um, we have no way to visualize that, and so by default, we hide it. Mm -hmm. But just because we're hiding it by default doesn't mean you can unhide it. And uh, the library you're talking about is called Mm dbImage, and and it was basically my attempt at uh, making a nice field template control that would display images out of a database. Yeah. And so the way that works is you go and, and put your own uh, field template control in that understands that type. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on your model, you're going to go and put one of those UI hints we talked about earlier and say, right. hey, when this, when this column shows up, I want to use DB image for this column. And then we'll, instead of hiding that column, now we're going, okay, since you've told us you know how to display it, right. we'll, we'll turn that rule off and we'll go find the field template that uh, supports yeah. you know, what you said. And suddenly you knew what this thing is. Exactly. But because it was an image, I thought it was interesting because you had to uh, do two things. You had to render the image tag, the image source equals, but then that source equals had to point to somewhere. It had to actually go and, and get the image. So you ended up writing a handler that would go back into the database and, and get that as well. Yes, and, and, and I'm, I'm actually really proud of the handler. I mean, that's one of the, the things I would recommend somebody, if, if you, if you want to see some, some neat code, go look at the handler. From the, What's cool about the handler is we started going in this path of, I want to show an image from the database. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't want to write SQL. Right. Because as soon as I write SQL, I'm making assumptions about your database. Right. And, you know, this great feature that came out in, in .NET 3.5 was link. And so suddenly I can build this link query, and by building a link query, I'm not locked to... Is it SQL Server? Is it uh, Oracle? Mm-hmm. Is it MySQL? I don't have to worry about that because whatever provider they have on the back end is going to automatically convert the link query to the correct 
um, you know, Query right, it'll just work. It's a it's a it's a comfortable layer of abstraction. That's you know we know about the database because we're using linked to SQL or linked entities, but we don't know that much. We don't not too intimate with the database. That's right. So if you if you look at the source code for the handler, all we're really doing there is is specifying the primary key of the uh, the table uh, and the uh, column that contains the image. Mm-hmm. And then if you look at the source code, it's actually dynamically building a link query. So most of the time when you see people doing link queries. Uh, you know, you just built some text string, mm-hmm. um, but this is actually a dynamic link query. So if you want to see an example of how you would actually build an expression tree uh, to, to build a query by hand, that's what this does. But as I said, the neat thing about that is it means that uh, it's not tied to any particular storage format. This should work on Oracle. Mm-hmm. It should work on Unity Framework. Um, there is no uh, tie-in. So that's something I don't think you could have done uh, pre.NET 3.5 before I would have had to have an Oracle version, a SQL version, a MySQL version, et cetera, and, and Link has really allowed me to to pull that out. So all of the stuff that we've been talking about so far is going to be available in an upcoming update to the to the framework, so people will get this in their hands uh, as soon as possible. What are some of the things that you're starting to think about where you could take this? Are we going to be able to use this in, in Silverlight? Am I going to be able to use this in other other places? Yeah, that's that's one of the things that uh, we we – when we started working with this, we actually met with a bunch of other teams at Microsoft and started talking about a lot of the concepts and stuff we were talking about uh, make sense way outside of ASP.NET. Mm-hmm. And so all these attributes that you're going to put on your data model to tell dynamic data what to do, mm-hmm. they don't live in system.web. They live in system.componentmodel.data annotations. Mm-hmm. And that was done on purpose um, because we thought other teams would want to use this. Uh, so I, already, I can already tell you that some other teams like the Silverlight team are looking at uh, maybe supporting this in the future where mm-hmm. you would take these same attributes, spread them all over your data model, mm-hmm. and then when you render your data with Silverlight, uh, you would get the same validation and all the other behaviors that uh, that we support. Very cool. I'd like to be able to do this over maybe an existing data model that I've got. Maybe I have my own ORM framework or I'm using Inhibernate or, you know, just plain old objects of some kind and somehow be able to annotate them and enable it such that I could do this kind of dynamicism. Yeah, uh, w- one of the things that we're working on is, uh, first off, our V1 for sure supports Entity Framework and Link to SQL. Mm-hmm. Um, we are trying to put the right hooks in, so if you're Subsonic or somebody else and you have your own data model, um, you would have a way to write a provider to mm-hmm. plug in, and we would be able to uh, figure out what uh, your data looks like. T- to give you an example of what that really means is, Obviously, what, part of what our technology does is it looks at your data model and crawls over all the tables and stuff mm-hmm. and then builds an internal abstraction that contains just the information that we need. Mm-hmm. And so that's the hook we're trying to provide is you would write that call mm-hmm. where, okay, walk over your model and fill in this data structure we give you. Mm-hmm. And then based on that, you know, it should enable a lot of the other functionality that dynamic data So it's does. a generic method to provide the metadata about your model and saying, tell me about yourself. That's correct. A reflection over the database. That's right. Very and cool. uh, it, it, for, for version one, it's probably going to be some low level hooks. Mm-hmm. But uh, for version two, uh, I think we're going to try to do more. So. so that's a scenario that you're going to definitely try to push for, for two for the average Joe. But maybe we'll figure out some funky advanced way to do it for the first release. Yeah, I think for the first release, if you're, if you're subsonic or, or in a hibernate or whatever, mm-hmm. there'll be, you know, you would be able to write a provider. I don't think the average Joe would be able to write that provider. It's yeah. going to require some, some hardcore technical knowledge to okay. do that. But I think when, when V2 comes around, uh, hopefully we could just consume an arbitrary collection of objects. Very cool. So uh, at the time that this podcast is going to be coming out here at the, uh, at the end of the second week of April, folks can go and get a preview of dynamic data up at Code Gallery, and I'll put links to all of the different things, the screencasts, your blog, David Ebo's blog, up on, uh, on the Hansel Minutes show site. And then soon we'll, we'll be able to have this built into the system so we won't have to download any preview bits. That's correct. You can grab it on Code Gallery right now. Um, It'll be up there until we actually RTM. Okay. And our actual plan is uh, probably to keep updating even past RTM. So we're going to move right into version 2. Okay, and cool. we're going to continue to use Code Gallery to extend uh, the first version. So it's kind of like the ASP.NET AJAX stuff where it was built in, but they're still going and they're making changes and those will be web downloadable at some point. That's correct. I, I really hope that, uh, you know, as you said, you know, you're new to Microsoft, I'm new to Microsoft. And one of the things that I think that uh, Microsoft needs more of is... None of these, uh, you know, we ship two CTPs a year and then we ship it and and don't have a lot of feedback cycles. We'd much rather have a lot of our new code out there for the public to see more often and give us more feedback on. Mm -hmm. Uh, Our our code can only be as good as the feedback we get. So, Well, yeah, certainly, and you and I don't know enough to not try to do these things. 
So, so the fact that you're making, you know, attempting to do this and get that get that loop tightened up is is pretty cool, and hopefully they won't beat us down. Uh, they've been pretty accepting this far, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy cool. with it. I think the dynamic data, uh, in rep, you know, kind of juxtaposing it with the MVC is just another example of some of the stuff that us new guys are trying to really make happen inside of Microsoft. So I'm I'm pretty stoked about it, and I'm going to actually try to do a series of of screencasts and videos and stuff and put them up on uh, NASP.net as we get closer to the release. Great. Thanks a lot. Cool. Thanks a lot. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you.